For short, we are thrilled to partner with the Massachusetts chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates to host this year's James Otis Constitution Day program. We are so glad to have so many students and teachers here with us today to celebrate the 230th anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution on September 17, 1787. We would also like to welcome the people tuning in to today's program via our live stream. Video of today's program will also be available online immediately after the conclusion of this event at Fora.tv and on Consource's social media pages. There is an often told story that at the end of the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was approached by a woman who asked him what sort of government the delegates had created. Franklin famously replied, a republic if you can keep it. Madam. To keep it, our citizens actually have to know about it. And unfortunately, there are countless studies and reports that confirm that American citizens of all ages lack a basic understanding of our nation's history and form of government. I know none of you fall into that category. There are some people who think that the Bill of Rights, one in 10 people think that the Bill of Rights secures the right to own a pet. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't for, for the record, it does not. Uh, Consource and the American Board of familiar. Trial Advocates are committed to addressing the troubling decline in constitutional literacy. Over the last 12 and a half years, Consource has done this by creating a comprehensive, easily searchable, fully indexed and freely accessible digital library of historic sources related to the creation, ratification, and amendment of the United States Constitution. We also uh, create research reports and educational resources, including free lesson plans, to meet the specific needs of educators and students, scholars and authors, legal practitioners and government officials, journalists, and the general public. We also host and co-host public programs like today's James Otis Lecture, with acclaimed legal scholars Akhil Amar of Yale Law School and Mary Sarah Builder of Boston College Law School. Professors Amar and Builder will discuss the founders, framers, and the future, applying the Constitution in the 21st century. I, ha I now have the privilege of introducing my dear friend and colleague, Chris Duggan, who has hosted the incredible James Otis Lecture Series here in Boston for 10 years. Chris will introduce our distinguished panel uh, lecturers and will moderate today's program. And I realize I'm first introducing Richard Middleton from the Aboda Foundation, my apologies, before we hand it off to Chris. Um, but on behalf of Consors and the Massachusetts chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates, I wish everyone here a very happy Constitution Day. I hope all of you will continue your study of the Constitution after today's program. I invite you to visit consource.org to explore our free educational resources as well as our collection of historical documents about the Constitution. Thank you, Richard. Before you get started, Richard, uh, let me just say this. Thank you all for coming to our 10th annual uh, James Otis Lecture. It is a, a great honor and privilege to be here at the EMK for the first time, and we thank the folks here at the EMK for making this such a wonderful um, place to hold this lecture. Um, to my right is my friend Richard Middleton, who is the president of the Foundation of the American Board of Trial Advocates, one of the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, Richard is uh, an attorney in Georgia, so he's come all the way up here from Savannah, Georgia. Um, he is a graduate of Washington Lee University and Washington and Lee Law School. He's a past president of the Americans Association for Justice, which at one time was called ATLA, and is uh, among the many other titles that he has or currently holds, uh, is a co-chair of the American Civil uh, Roundtable. Mr. Middle. Thank you, Chris. Well, I've been, I want to welcome all of you to the EMK. Uh, and I want to tell you, I want, just want to take one moment and talk about what ABODA, the American Board of Trial Advocates, is all about. Uh, ABODA is an honorary association of trial lawyers who work both on the defense side of cases and on the plaintiff side of cases. In other words, lawyers who bring lawsuits and lawyers who defend lawsuits and that is a civilized way to resolve disputes. And our forefathers saw the importance of this and in fact uh, uh, embellished their understanding of the need for an organized and literal way to take care of civil disputes 
by passing the Seventh Amendment. And ABOTA is uh, dedicated to the preservation of the Seventh Amendment. You all know what the First Amendment is, free speech. We hear about it every day now, don't we? All weekend we've heard about the right to free speech. And the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. God, that's talked about all the time. But very seldom do you hear about the Seventh Amendment, and that is the right to a trial by jury in all civil disputes that you bring. And it is under constant assault. You all probably know, you've heard of arbitration and compulsory mediation where courts make you sit down and try to settle disputes without getting before a jury. I'm not here to, de to debate those two uh, premises, but I do want you to understand that ABOTA is about making all of us, Chris, myself, and others who practice in the courtroom to be better practitioners. It teaches us to be more civil. We have professional education programs because we found that our profession constantly needs to be updated and reminded of the needs to be civil towards each other, civil towards the parties to disputes, and civil to the entire process. And then we also have educational programs where we reach out to young people like you. The James Otis Lecture Series is but one example uh, of our programs. And that's due in large part, completely due, to Chris Duggan. Uh, the James Otis Lecture Series, if I, if I may have one more moment. Uh, Chris, it was his vision, it was his concept, he put it together, he brought it to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and then he came to Aboda and he said, this is a program that is so dynamic, we really ought to do this nationwide. And so we indeed are. I want to tell you that last week I was in the state capitol in Austin, Texas, and they had a James Otis lecture series. And I want to tell you that it's a much bigger state and much, many more people, but you all have more students here than Texas did last week. So congratulations. Welcome. I hope you uh, get a lot out of this, and I hope living in the society that you are in today's climate, that you will take away from this lessons that you will hold dear to your heart and you will respect what the founders did and what we all are trying to do to keep this country on the straight and narrow path. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Richard. Okay. <clears throat> founders, framers, and the future. Interpreting the Constitution in the 21st century. One of the real challenges that we have, I think, uh, is trying to apply a document that was written in the late 18th century to 21st century problems. Does what the framers thought when they were debating what became the United States Constitution in Philadelphia in 1787 have any bearing at all on how it should be applied, it should be interpreted in 2017. How about what the people who listened and debated over it during the ratification process? Does that have any bearing on how the Constitution should be interpreted and applied? Or do we need a living, breathing constitution redefined uh, as we go along to deal with uh, problems that could not have been envisioned by the uh, forefathers in 1787 or by the framers uh, of the 14th Amendment in 1868? Those are the central issues that we're going to deal with today, and we have uh, the two preeminent scholars in field in these issues. We're very lucky to have with us, to my far left, Professor Mary Sarah Bilder. Professor Bilder teaches uh, uh, American legal and constitutional history, as well as property and trust and estates at Boston College Law School. She is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, she also has a, a JD from uh, Harvard University, I've heard of it. It's the school across the river that people go to when they can't get into BC. Um, and uh, 
she has, after getting a JD from, from Harvard, she got both a master's and a doctorate in, uh, in history, the history of American civilization and American studies from Harvard. She was a clerk to the Honorable Francis Murnahan at the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, her scholarship has focused most recently on the history of the Constitution, James Madison, and the founders, uh, the history of judicial review, and the colonial era, and the founding era of uh, constitutionalism. Her most recent book is this one here, which is a terrific book, and it's called Madison's Hand. Revising the Constitutional Convention, and it's about uh, the notes that James Madison took. As many of you probably know, um, Madison took uh, copious notes, at least for a while, during the Constitutional Convention. Um, and um, his notes have been used by those who try to divine what the original intent was uh, of the um, framers when they were debating the many issues that ultimately led to the United States Constitution. Uh, this book won the 2016 very prestigious Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy, and also the James C. Bradford Prize for Biography uh, from the Society of Historians of the Early Republic. Um, she has published several other books and articles, and uh, has published in virtually uh, you know, most of the really prestigious uh, law journals, including the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, Yale the Journal of Law and Humanitarian, uh, Humanities, George Washington Law Review, and others. She has been granted more honors and grants than I can go on <laughs> about right now. Um, she's a member of the American Law Institute, the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, the Mass Historical Society, has been a visiting professor at Columbia and at Harvard. Um, has appeared in documentaries uh, by the Documentary Group, the History Channel, and also served as a legal history consultant to Steven Spielberg in the movie Armistead. And for those of you who are interested in going to law school one day, I have to include this. <laughs> Professor Bilder is the author of a blog on how to teach the rule against perpetuities mm -hmm. in an hour. <laughs> And as someone who took property and could never figure out the rule against perpetuity, I said, I wish that blog had been around when I was there. <laughs> Would you please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Mary Sarah Bilder. <laughs> and to my immediate left uh, is Professor Akil Reed Amar, the uh, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale College and Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale summa cum laude in 1980 uh, and from Yale Law School in 1984, he clerked for then judge and now justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, and then immediately after joined the Yale Law School faculty at the age of 26. Uh, he has published numerous books, including America's Constitution, a biography, and um, many others. Uh, most recently, the Constitution today Timeless Lessons for the Issues of Our Era. Professor uh, Amar has, uh, uh, worked has been cited, his work has been cited favorably by the United States Supreme Court justices in more than 30 cases um, on all sorts of issues and all sorts of cases across a broad spectrum. And he regularly um, testifies in Capitol Hill, as he will tomorrow, um, for called by representatives of, of both parties. Um, Professor Amar has written, uh, in addition to several books, has uh, written several publications for the New York Times, for the Washington Post, for the Wall Street Journal, for the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic, and Slate. Um, and he was an informal consultant to several popular TV shows, including West Wing, um, The Colbert Report, Colbert Report, and Charlie Rose and the O'Reilly Factor, which will tell you that he covers both sides of the spectrum, uh, including his honors. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a recipient of the American Bar Foundation's annual Outstanding Scholar Award, the Howard R. Lamar Award for Distinguished Service to Yale, and the Devane, Devane Medal for Yale's highest award for teaching excellence. We are very honored to have with us today Professor Akil Riedemar.
So let's get right to it. Um, Professor Bilder, let me start with you. Uh, when this book came out last year, I read it almost immediately. It is a terrific book. Thank you very um, much. And, um, but I must say, the topic didn't necessarily jump off the page to me. And I was wondering how you came about, how you got interested in the topic, and how you came about writing a, a book on Madison's notes. Yeah, how, how many people in the room have had to write a research paper? So, so being a law professor is a lot like having to write a research paper every semester or every year. And you know the problem with writing a research paper is you have to do a lot of research. So I'd done a lot of papers with a lot of research. And I had little kids. And I thought, well, I'll do a paper that doesn't require a lot of research. I'll do a paper where all I do is read James Madison's famous notes of the Constitutional Convention. And then I'll just think about it. And then I'll just write a book about what I think it was. It was a great idea for a research paper. Maybe you can try it yourself sometime. And James Madison is the person who wrote the notes of the Constitutional Convention. How many of you have studied the Constitutional Convention? OK, so for people whose hands didn't go up, the Constitutional Convention in 1787 um, in Philadelphia wrote the Constitution that um, we consider our Constitution today. It didn't look like our Constitution, because at that point, it wasn't amended. So it, they wrote the part of the Constitution um, that is the main part, the seven articles, and then it was um, amended. And there was an official recorder for that, but um, there weren't cameras in those days, and the public wasn't allowed to watch. And so one person took notes of every single day, and that's James Madison, who was a young delegate from Virginia. And James Madison's notes are the way that we know most of what happened at the convention. Because in his notes, the convention seems very exciting, because he took sort of like a play what everybody said. So that was the great text. And I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just read that one text and do my research paper on that. And I started thinking, trying to figure out like what was the version of those notes that was closest to the ones that he had written that summer. And as I worked my way back through older editions, back and back and back in time, towards 1787, I began to realize that the document that we have taken to be James Madison's notes, which most people thought were James Madison's notes just as he was writing them, were actually James Madison's notes as he kind of rewrote them somewhat, and then maybe wrote them a little bit later, and then fixed them over time. So he'd be a, a sort of more important person, and the convention would take on a more important meaning. And so I decided to write a book about how if we go back to his notes, try and reconstruct what his notes were when he took them that summer of 1787, we can go back and see what the convention was like for the people who were there. That is, try and get back in the space where it was a very exciting moment. They were trying to figure out all sorts of things. They didn't know about the future. And that's what they wanted, that it was sort of not as boring as it's sometimes done. So that's what the book tries to do. It tries to <coughs> imagine what the convention felt like when you're a 36 or 37-year-old person in a room with a lot of people way more famous than you, and you're trying to sort out which way the country should go. Professor Bilder, could you um, maybe take us back to 1786 and 1787 and give us a little background as to what led to the convention and what were the, uh, the reasons that they were, the delegates actually gathered in Philadelphia in May of that year? OK, so uh, how many people know about the Declaration of Independence? OK, good. How many people had to memorize the preamble of the Constitution? How many people don't remember if they had to rem memorize it? <laughs> How many people are from Massachusetts? How, you probably all had to memorize it, because <laughs> it's part of the Massachusetts school curriculum. But um, you did that in elementary school, so that suggests you don't remember it very well. Um, in 1776, right, um, the Congress that was operating created a Declaration of Independence. We broke from England. We became our own country. They sent out a second committee. One committee wrote the Declaration of Independence. Another committee was assigned to write basically a constitution, a first constitution that would govern this country. That 
document, that first constitution, we call the Articles of Confederation. And I like to think of it as a first constitution because it reminds us that things don't always work out the way we hope. And so they wrote that first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and there were problems with that first constitution. There was only one branch, Congress. There was only one house in that branch, so it was just Congress. And every state got one vote. And there was no president, and there was no judiciary, and there was no way you could force any of the states to do anything. And in one of the famous lines, they called <coughs> themselves a firm league of friendship. We would want to think of them as a nation. And so within the decade, that document had begun to fall apart. It became apparent that other countries might invade because the United States looked pretty weak. They couldn't figure out how to do anything. They couldn't raise any money. George Washington was annoyed because he couldn't pay his troops. And so some people like Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and James Madison and others decided that before the country fell apart or got invaded, they should figure out how to write another document. And so they got Congress to, persuade, to agree that all the states would send delegates to Philadelphia to write basically a new document, a new constitution. Professor Marr, um, the Constitutional Convention began in uh, May, May 28th, I think was the first day, and ended on September 17th, so about four and a half months. Um, could you give us an idea of what the, what the major issues were that the delegates were grappling with over that four and a half months worth of time? Such an honor to be with you. Thanks uh, for having me. So, you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, you don't e quite understand what you're doing. It's, there's a, uh, it's clear only in retrospect. We, you know, we live life going forward, but it only makes sense looking back. And that's a big theme of Mary's book, Professor Builder's book, is as Madison looks back at later points in time, he has sort of a different perspective. So I, I'm going to tell you kind of from, from the last day, you know, in retrospect, what they were doing. So here's the basic problem, and Mary began to tell you. The basic problem, so you know, why, do you have a, why do you need a constitution? You say, well, to protect yourselves against the government, okay, for, to affirm rights. And if that's the key, boy, they were stupid because they actually does, don't propose a Bill of Rights. That comes about only um, later on. And, you know, rights are really important, but you know what? Um, if you're just are about trying to protect yourself against the government, the first question is, well, why do you need a government at all? And that's what the Constitution is about, is constituting, structuring the government, and why do you need it? And here's the basic point. You need it because if you don't have a sufficiently strong structure of government, you're dead because they're thugs out there in the world um, and you need to protect yourself against them. Um, so the ultimate imperative is a national security imperative. So here's the reality. The guy who becomes the president of this convention is George Washington. Well, you guys have heard of George Washington and you guys have heard of him in part because we're in Dorchester, right? Or, or close mm -hmm. to it. So he is the revolutionary general and basically he's getting his butt kicked every day except four or five days. He's losing the war every day except four or five good days. When he gets some cannons up here in Dorchester, apparently that's a good day, and, and the British leave. Okay, fine, but now they left. Now what are you gonna do? Because um, they didn't leave America, they moved to another port and they're still threatening you. So, so he's losing almost every day of the revolution. He's fighting a guerrilla campaign um, so there are these um, glorious moments. Sometimes they're actually just retreats. He, he escapes from um, uh, the, uh, Long Island, and then he gets, off, uh, he gets out of Manhattan when he's sort of um, in uh, a box. Yeah, there's some victories. There's Battle of Saratoga. There's, of course, um, uh, Trenton. Um, eventually, there's Yorktown. Maybe two or three other good days. That's it. And, and Yorktown's because the French show up. Do not count on the French. That's not going to happen again. Never count on the French. Okay? So, here's the problem. We barely won the Revolutionary War. We won it by this much. We were losing it basically every day. And Britain is still a very powerful country, and there may be another war. We call that, if there was, we call it the War of 1812. Um, but, and, and, and Spain is powerful, and France is powerful, and 
if we don't have um, um, an army to, to, that, that to protect ourselves, we're dead. We won the last one, we were lucky, don't count on that again. Now, the so-called first constitution that Professor Bill just told you about, the Articles Confederation, um, well, it's kind of, it, it is a league. It's like NATO or like the United Nations. Every state is represented, one state, one vote, in an, and, and, they, and they talk about things, and, um, and the states promise to pay money, and then they don't do it. It's kind of like the United Nations today. Now, the states are represented, and they're not paying, and you, you know, because if you want an army, you know what you need? You need money, because you have to actually pay them. And if you can't pay them, you're dead. That's the fundamental problem. So there's no money. It, the cupboard is bare, um, and, um, and the states aren't, aren't poning up. Now, when you work back from that, almost everything in the Constitution is basically trying to solve that problem. So I'll give you in six steps. They don't think about it this way as they're going through it. But in retrospect, it makes sense because, OK, we need an army. Well, at least you know, enough to, to repel the British when they attack again, or the Spanish, or you know, one day the French may turn against us. Uh, um, um, so, we need an army, we need to pay the army, we need money, states aren't kicking in. Ah, so we need to tax individuals, because individuals can be made to pay. When Virginia doesn't pay, what are you gonna do? Put Virginia as a state in jail? Per, put Massachusetts um, in jail? How is that gonna work? You know, if you've seen Shrek, you know, when he says, you and what army? You know, what, how are you going to actually make them do that? Well, individuals, you see, you can squeeze them. So we need to tax individuals. We can have um, uh, taxes on, uh, cust on imported goods. We've got these great ports like Boston, and stuff will come in. And if you want to buy something from Europe, you have to pay. OK, but now if individuals are going to be taxed, which you didn't have any of the articles, states are represented and states are taxed. But if individuals are going to be taxed, they have to be represented because you've heard of this thing called no taxation without representation. So if we're going to tax individuals, they have to be represented. Now, actually, people rather than states are going to have to be represented in the central government. That's a totally different thing. It's going to legislate on ordinary people. Um, states are going to actually have to follow the rules. It's they're going to actually be making laws, which Congress on the old Articles of Confederation really wasn't. It was more like recommendations that states sometimes follow not. So now we're going to have laws, and it's going to operate on individuals, and they're going to have to be represented. Well, now, that, that's very powerful. We should need to break it up into two branches, the way the Massachusetts legislature is in two, because two, it's a lot more powerful. We need a separate executive, just like Massachusetts has, um, with a veto pen, just like Massachusetts has, to keep check on the legislature. A separate judiciary, just like Massachusetts has. We're going to create a real government, and it's got to look like the government of Massachusetts. Okay. So two branches of the new federal government and a separate president who will also be good at protecting us against foreign thugs. He'll be a, like a commander in chief and a separate judiciary to keep an eye on, on everything. Um, okay, now who are the big losers? Uh, they're going to have power over foreign affairs and over the West, which the Articles of Confederation didn't have, so sort of more national power. Big losers, apart from France and Britain, Spain, the states aren't going to love this. They're losing power in this game. So what are we going to have to do? We're actually going to have to put it to a popular vote. Because ordinary people might be for it, even if state legislatures aren't. Because state legislatures are small-minded politicians who don't want to give up power to other um, politicians. We're going to have to put it to the people. And if we're going to put it to the people to vote for, well, we're going to have to have all sorts of democratic sweeteners in, in the thing, which the Constitution actually does do. And by the way, who put their Constitution to a vote first in the history of the world? That would be you all. The Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 is the first time in the history of the world that people got to vote on how they would be governed, 1778 and then 1780. So when you step back, it's basically all, you know, the fundamental problem is we gotta, um, we gotta have national security, which means an army, which means money, which means taxing individuals, which means representing individuals, passing real laws on individuals. Well, now we have to much more carefully structure the federal government so it looks like the state governments. Bicameralism, separate executive, separate judiciary, and we're going to put it to a vote and see if the people go for it. Now, um, before I ask the next question, I should tell you all that we have uh, microphones here in the front. Um, and in a few minutes, uh, uh, I'll ask you to come down. Anybody who has any questions, just line up. Uh, I'll choose you one of these, and I will... Uh, 
get you involved in the conversation. Um, but to follow up on what you just said, Professor Lamar, um, it seems to me that what you're telling us is that it was necessary, or we have felt it was necessary to come together more closely as one nation rather than 13 individuals, separate entities. Um, but that has some problems there, didn't it? Because each of those 13, or at least several of the regions, had very different views on what they wanted and what their own narrow interests were. Um, and uh, that caused some, some serious problems, some of the problems that we are still dealing with on Sunday afternoon. Um. So it, it's, it's a vast country, and there are times when I really, you know, I'm tired of those Texans, and I'm sure they're tired of, of Connecticut people like me. So like, well, why can't, you know, why do we need to be part of one country? And, and here's, they look around the world, these people like James Madison. Um, how many of you have read any of the Federalist Papers? Raise your hand. Okay, well, these are op-eds. Um, designed to persuade people to vote for it. Which Federalist paper did you read? Do you remember the number? Just shout it out. You read 10 and 51, and that's what they always assign, and those are not the ones, actually, that anyone pays any attention to at the time. Look, here's what's being proposed. In effect, world government for the new world, separated as it was by vast oceanic moats from the rest of the world. It's very, you know, 3,000 miles, and and they're proposing this big, stinky world government project, you know, because democracies hadn't existed very much in previous world history. Tiny little city-states, ancient Athens, pre-imperial Rome, um, uh, Florence, and now, so, if someone today were to say, well, we're gonna have a real world government with an army of the world and a world legislature that's gonna operate on you directly and world courts that can call you in from any part of the planet against anyone else and you're gonna to have to litigate against them and a president of the world, there's, you'd say, well, why can't we just stick with what we got? And there's only one thing that would ever make you go for that today. Men in black, aliens, Martians. And then you'd say, well, we've got our problems with the Russians and we don't always love the Chinese, but they are homo sapiens. What the heck, we're in, let's kick some alien butt. Now. That's what unifies people, that's what makes a nation, unfortunately, is a national security imperative. The people, they look around the world and they say, who's free in all the world? Because France is an absolutist tyranny and uh, the Russians grown under a czar and China actually has an emperor that, you know, that, that tells people what to do and, and India and Africa, all, you know, all of Western Europe basically, it's not um, um, East, uh, Eastern Europe, it's not free. The only people who are free are basically the Swiss and the Brits. Why? Because they've got defensible borders. It's hard to charge up the Alps and England is an, Britain is an island. We have to create a perfect union on the model of Scotland and England. We have to unify our island because here's why. If we don't, yeah, we don't love, you know, the, the South Carolinians and they don't love us. And if we don't create a union, if we just a firm legal friendship, well then eventually we'll start fighting each other. We'll have um, each of us will have an army, and then we're going to be like Europe with ar big, you build your army, and I build my army, and you build yours bigger, and I build mine bigger, and then pretty soon there's no liberty. Why is England free? Because when England and Scotland are separate, you see, they're always fighting each other, and Mel Gibson is coming down and whomping on the, the English, and, and you have to unify that island, and then you're free when you don't have a huge military. We have to create a perfect union. We have to become one nation so that actually our guns point out against the Brits um, and, and not against each other. That's basically the geostrategic imperative that drives the Constitution. And that whole thing maybe makes no sense today. See, because today we actually are one world. We can't hide behind our oceans. The rest of the world is democratic in a way that it's not before. So one of the questions that we're going to talk about is to what extent does the Constitution still make sense today given that, that our world is a different world? Before we get to that, though, Professor Bill, I want to go back to your book um, and, uh, and ask you uh, two questions. The first is you mentioned that uh, Madison was uh, really the you know, most copious note taker, at least for a fair amount, until I guess he stopped taking them around August. Um, but there were other people who took notes as well. Um, however, the, uh, the Constitution passed, a, 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 the um, group passed a rule 
of secrecy, absolute secrecy, before they did anything. What impact did that have on how this debate took place and how the information got out to the people? Yeah, one of the things that we sometimes forget about the convention is that um, we think we have a right to watch the Senate, watch the House, basically all the forms of government, except we can't go inside the Supreme Court and watch them talk. Um, and the court still doesn't allow cameras to watch the oral argument. But the Constitution's written at a time when people don't yet believe that. The Constitution's written at a time when sometimes the public could sit up in the galleries and watch, but in England, if somebody said, I spy a stranger, the galleries got cleared. That is, nobody thought at the time that the Constitution was adopted yet that the public had a right to watch everything that happened. And so the convention, in this respect, actually is sort of more the norm than we would think today. In fact, when the Senate, you're sitting in the Senate chambers, when the Senate first opened in 1789, they didn't let the public in. They thought that they had a right to deliberate, in essence, in secret. And only in the 1790s did the public demand that they should be allowed to watch and send reporters in. And so only in the 1790s did the Senate and the House together finally be public in that way. So the Constitution was written behind closed doors. And they did that because they thought there would be a lot of things that people would disagree on. And if everybody was running back and trying to find out what everybody thought about it, they couldn't sort of solve problems first. So that summer, they were very careful. They kept the doors closed. They didn't let anybody who wasn't elected uh, to participate. And they fought their way verbally through an enormous number of an enormous number of issues. And let me just talk about a couple issues just so, so we get them. So the issue that they spent two months fighting about was whether this institution that you're sitting in, the Senate, should basically exist. Because people like James Madison and the Massachusetts delegates all thought that both the upper house and the lower house, the Senate and the House, should have be based on proportional representation. That is, the number of delegates you should get should depend on how big of a state you were in terms of people. And so if you're Virginia, which is a big state, or you're Massachusetts, that's a big state, or you're Pennsylvania, that's a big state, you think that's great. Who do you think doesn't like that idea? New Jersey. Who else do you think doesn't like that idea? Rhode Island. Who else? Delaware. New Hampshire. In fact, the Rhode Islanders knew from the outset this was a bad idea, because they were a tiny little state. What do you think they did? They stayed at home. They never showed up. It's a great lesson, not a good strategy. <laughs> okay? Nobody noticed that they weren't there, but they couldn't participate. New Hampshire in the beginning thought they'd stay at home, right? Like, oh, I don't like what's going on. I'm just going to stay here. And then they suddenly realized, like, wait, they're all going on without us. And if we don't get down there, we'll be in trouble. And so they arrived late, but it mattered immensely that they came. And so little New Jersey and Connecticut were left to be like, if we aren't careful, we're going to end up completely being overwhelmed by big states like Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. And they were particularly worried because Virginia was about the same size if you just counted white people. But if you counted all the African American people who they held in slavery who would never be allowed to vote, Virginia was almost twice as large as any of the other states. And so for two months they fought over whether there would be some way to restrain the power of the very big states. And finally, in July, they agree. And they agree to form what's called the Connecticut Compromise. It's the compromise that creates this institution, the Senate, so that every state has the same number of senators, two senators each, and allows proportional representation in the House. But along the way, what they also did was they basically embedded the power that states like Virginia had from enslaving people into the Constitution in the Three-Fifths Clause. 
And I think this is something that Professor Anamar and I both in our books think is really important to understand about the Constitution that was written in 1787, that it was a Constitution that was built on a fundamentally wrong thing, which was people held other people in slavery, and they held African Americans in slavery. And the Constitution gave more power to states that held people like that. So for a very, very long time in this country, ironically, the more enslaved people your state had, the more power you as a state or a region had. And so what that meant is that southern slave holding states ran things. And Professor Amar can tell you, because he has wonderful statistics in his book, about how many of those states controlled branches of the government. Could one of you explain uh, how exactly the three-fifths clause that you alluded to, Professor Vilda, came about um, and uh, how it, in effect, worked um, uh, to result in, what, five of the first six presidents being from slaveholding states, or six of the first seven? Yeah, let me let, let, me let Professor Amar do that, because he does a great job in his book of this. Um, <clears throat> so, um, by the way, let me just say one other thing. The reason that I told you that the Federalist 10 isn't the, the, the place to look, if you had a, an, a re, an, a re, an op ed like why we should have world government, you wouldn't wait to your 10th op ed to make it, would you? Um, so if you go home tonight and you have to read any Federalist paper, read eight, which summarizes all the early Federalist papers. The three big themes of the Constitution, I think, are democracy, national security, and slavery. I told you a lot about national security, and that's what the entire early Federalist Papers are about, how we need to create one nation, because if we don't, we'll start fighting against each other, but if we're able to unite, then we'll, we'll survive. Um, so that's the geostrategy geostrate national security point. I told you they put the thing to a vote. We, the people, um, Professor Bill asked if you'd read the preamble, well, we, the people, dot, 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 for common defense, among other things, do ordain and establish this Constitution. So we actually put it to a vote. That's the democracy point. And we're going to get to vote for a House of Representatives, which you didn't get to do under the Articles of Confederation. Um, and there are no property qualifications to be a member of the House or the Senate or the presidency. Democracy, geostrategy, or national security, but now the slavery theme. That's, I th those are, I think, the three big themes of the original Constitution. When I was your age, I thought, well, yes, three-fifths is so offensive. Everyone's equal. We're all God's children. We're all created equal. But if you think that way, then you'd think that it should be five-fifths. Everyone counts for one, free and slave. No, because as she told you, the question isn't, are slaves voting? Of course, they're not voting. The question is slave states and how, many, how much credit they're going to get for the existence of slavery in their states. So if you're actually a principled anti-slavery um, anti person, the answer should be zero. You should never, ever get more seats in the House of Representatives because you're actually enslaving people. And since she was a consultant Amistad, you know, you go, people, slave catchers, they go over, kidnap people who were born free in Africa. People die in these slave wars, just like their diamond wars today. So all these people are being kidnapped and killed. They're brought over across the Atlantic in a hellish middle passage in which a quarter of them die. They're thrown overboard. It's just horrible, dying of disease. And, and when they reach here and they're bought off, the, sold off on, off on auction blocks and families are, are torn apart, you know, children from their mothers, um, uh, uh, husbands and wives, the state's getting more seats in the House of Representatives when you do that. That's horrible. So it shouldn't be five-fifths. It shouldn't have been three-fifths. In principle, it should have been zero-fifths. Um, but, the, you know, certain states, like South Carolina, don't want that. The Deep South doesn't want that. Virginia's kind of in, in the middle. Where did they get that number? They kind of plucked it from a hat in a way, but here's where they originally got it. Under the articles, they got it actually originally from an earlier debate about taxation and how much each state should actually pay into the coffers of the Articles Confederation. The thought is, well, if you're a wealthier state, you should pay more. And so we're going to apportion each state's quota 
of, of dues to the UN. We, you know, America pays a quarter of the UN dues because we're a very wealthy nation compared to the rest of the world. And so our UN dues today are based on our wealth. So the Articles of Confederation said, well, the wealthiest states should pay more. But they don't have actually a real great way of actually apportioning how wealthy each state is. So they said, okay, we're just going to count the people. The more people you have, kind of on average, the wealthier you're going to be. So let's actually just count people. That's a, a rough proxy, a crude measure of wealth. Well, now, how do you count slaves? And in that debate, you know, the North says, oh, these slaves, they're very productive. They should be counted at one because you can actually whip them and make them do a lot of work there. They're just as, they're more productive than, than lazy white farmers. So count them as one. And the Southerners say, oh, no, they eat a lot. You can't get any work out of them. You should count them as zero. And they end up counting them as three-fifths when the South wants it, you know, as low and the North wants it as high. But that debate was all about who's going to pay taxes um, when each state is assessed a quota, but somehow it gets pulled in just because it's, it's, it's what, what you call a focal. It's just a, a number that people have thought about. It, it's kind of connected to slavery. So now they're bringing it in in the debate about representation. How much extra should Virginia get over Massachusetts and Pennsylvania? Because Virginia has all these slaves. And in that debate, actually Virginia wants it high and Massachusetts wants it low, um, but they just pluck this number out of a hat three-fifths. And here's what she didn't quite say, and then I'll shut up. Look, you say, well, we don't have that anymore, Professor. You know, we got rid of that. There was this thing called the Civil War. Why do you have the Electoral College, which generated a president who got fewer votes than the person who ran against uh, him. Well, you were taught, oh, it's because they didn't really believe in democracy. Well, they put the thing to a vote. It's actually very democratic for its time. I don't think that's the reason. You were taught, oh, it's a balance between big and st small states. Well, how come the big state guy wins every time? The first eight of the first nine presidential elections are won by a Virginian, OK? And Massachusetts is the ninth, John Adams, and then John Quincy. Well, that's the second or third biggest state, depending on how you count. It also included Maine at the time. The big state guys win all the time. Only three state presidents in all of American history. Bill Clinton, Franklin Pierce, Zachary Taylor, that's it. It's not a balance between big and small states, the Electoral College. It's not because they don't believe in democracy. It's slavery. Because without, if you had to just a direct election of the president, Virginia wouldn't be very happy because its slaves can't count in that. They're not voting in election. Pennsylvania is going to do well. Massachusetts is going to do well. Virginia, not so much. But if you have an Electoral College, you can give each state credit for its slaves, because remember, three-fifths isn't just the rule for the House of Representatives, it's also the rule for the number of electoral college votes a state gets, because that's based on two senators for each state plus the number of representatives, which in turn is based on three-fifths. The electoral college was all about slavery. This is not what I was taught when I was in high school. It's what I have come to believe. And I think a lot of Mary's work looking at Philadelphia provides further support for that thesis. She and I both think slavery is a bigger deal than our teachers taught us it was. Press Builder? Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. And I think it's one of the things that's sometimes hard when I think of, of, you know, like how do we think about a constitution? How do we think about a constitution that we know in five places without ever using the word slave protected the right of some white people to own others. Including James Madison, right. whom, as you, who, as you say, never frees his slaves. Right. James Madison owned over 100 people, 100 people in enslavement. He never freed a single person. And he knew slavery was wrong. He wrote that slavery was wrong. He understood if you were a slave, you would want to be free. But he did not get himself out of that, and nobody in that generation figured out how to write a constitution that didn't have that. So one of the things with the constitution is, is the constitution that we have today has some things from 1787, that's part of the 1787 constitution, and that it has a whole lot of things that are different because the constitution's been amended. And so a lot of the things that at the beginning made sense to them wouldn't make sense to us today and have been changed. So just to give you another example, uh, when Julie started, right, she told you this story. It's a very famous story about a woman whose name was Elizabeth Willing Powell, who when Ben Franklin walked out of the door, said, what kind of government is that? 
And I actually love that story because what does it tell you people like me were? We were outside. Somebody always says to me when I give a talk, like, who would you like to be? <laughs> and I'm like, I wouldn't have been there, right? I mean, I wouldn't have been there because women weren't allowed to participate. Now, women, that's not everybody doesn't think that. In the 1790s, women vote in New Jersey. But they don't vote for the people that a lot of the people in power think they should be voting for. So the New Jersey Constitution has changed to bar women from voting. But so our Constitution, one thing that's very important about our Constitution is that our Constitution has changed over time. I was thinking about that when we heard about civil juries. Because one of the things our Constitution does in the Constitution is it protects the right of criminal juries, of juries in criminal cases, but it doesn't protect the right for people to have a jury in a civil case. And in some ways, a jury in a civil case is a great equalizer. It's a chance for people, even if they're poor, sometimes even if they're unrepresented, to get to plead their case before ordinary people, not just before a judge. And so we only get that protection because the Constitution's amended. So the amendment that gives us civil juries is part of a whole package of amendments that begin to change the 1787 Constitution in ways that are incredibly important to fulfill this sort of understanding that the Constitution is supposed to be a Constitution about we the people. So when you put it to people to vote, the first thing they say is, dudes, you forgot the rights. You know, We've got a Bill of Rights in our Massachusetts Constitution. There's a Declaration of Rights in Pennsylvania and in a bunch of other states. You know, Where is it in this document? The Constitution is crowdsourced, you see. And, and what we call the Bill of Rights is version 2.0. It's like Wikip you know, Wikipedia <laughs> avant la lettre. It's you know, ordinary people saying, you very brainy people in Philadelphia, you were behind closed doors and you did forget some stuff. And that's just the beginning, these amendments. Five times the original Bill of Rights, what we call the first 10 amendments, talk about the rights of the people. The people under the First Amendment can petition and assemble. And the people have right to keep and bear arms on the second and to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures under the fourth. And there are retained and reserved rights under the ninth and tenth amendments of the people. Why five mentions of the people in the first, the second, the fourth, the ninth, the tenth? Because it's coming from bottom up from we the people, but not everyone, you see, as you heard, women in general outside of New Jersey aren't voting. Uh, what about even free blacks in other places? What about slavery? But that's not the end of the amendments. So eventually these amendments, it's gonna be democracy sort of exploding across time. You're gonna, they're gonna get rid of slavery. They're gonna promise equal citizenship, birthright citizenship for, for all male and female, black and white, black suffrage. Women are going to get the vote and therefore get to serve on juries. Since you're mentioning juries, women aren't on juries because they're not voting. But these amendments um, are going to transform American democracy in our lifetime. 18-year-olds get the vote because if you're old enough to fight and die, possibly in Vietnam, you're old enough to vote on whether you should be in that war in the first place. So the amendments are a huge part of this ongoing intergenerational we the people story. I think we yeah, both let's believe just, that. Let's just stop for one second and ask that, because that's a great point about people voting. We sometimes forget this. How many people are going to be able to vote the next time there's a presidential election? How many people, if the voting age was 21, would be able to vote in the next presidential election? A few people are like, me. Okay. We have a few older parents or teachers. Yeah, me, OK. But that's an incredible thing, right? It's one of the most recent amendments that drops the voting age in elections from 21 to 18. And it's a perfect example of how under the original Constitution, you were all disenfranchised. None of you would be able to vote next time around. And now, right, like I have a 14-year-old daughter who listens to political podcasts. How many people listen to podcasts? This is like, I'm always telling people this. I know senators and things, they're like, podcasts, whoever heard of a podcast? I'm like, I'm telling you, future voters, they're all listening to podcasts, right? In the, this is one of the most important amendments, I think, of recent amendments, is allowing people who are 18 
to be able to vote, just like to be able to do military service, to becoming a full citizen at that point. I won't say anything about the drinking age because I actually think that should be 18 too, but we're being taped, so that's probably a bad thing to have said. <laughs> um, I'd like to get up now to uh, the second part of our talk, but before I do, uh, I've, uh, I'm going to claim the, uh, the right of the chair here uh, to go back to one issue in the Constitutional Convention, because I think it's really funny. Um, how many people here have either uh, watched the play Hamilton or heard the music? Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, Hamilton has become a rock star in um, our, our time, much to John Adams' dismay, no doubt. Um, but Hamilton actually gave a speech in June um, that um, because the Constitutional Convention had voted secrecy, didn't really get out until later. And I was wondering if, uh, uh, Professor Bill, you could talk a little bit about that speech. It's because it's actually mentioned, it, it, if, you, if you listen to the music, it actually is uh, referred to in, in one of the music pieces. Yeah. Um, and it ends up coming back to haunt him a little bit. Yeah. OK, so here's the, so I, my daughters are always like, how come you have to write about something boring like the convention? Because the convention, if, if you've seen Hamilton, you know the soundtrack by heart, you know the convention gets like, I was at the Constitutional Convention. OK, and then it goes on to other things. So the Constitutional Convention is very short. Even writing the Federalist Papers is very short. Um, Alexander Hamilton uh, was at the convention. Uh, the other two members of the New York delegation couldn't stand him. And they knew that all they had to do was disappear and he couldn't vote because you needed two people from your state to be there in order to vote. But Hamilton, having worked with George Washington, having been an officer, agreed with people like the Virginians and General Washington that the country needed to be strong, that it needed to be a national country. The other two New Yorkers didn't. But the Virginians had a plan. The people who wanted a national government had a plan. But their plan was vulnerable. A lot of people thought it looked too strong. It made the country too powerful. It made the national government too powerful. And so they were very worried. And an alternative plan had been put forward, which would have made the government pretty weak and tiny and caught with the states. And now here's the moment that Alexander Hamilton appears. And you can have two different interpretations of this. Alexander Hamilton walks in that morning in June, and he gives a great speech. He talks all day, like for six hours. And he suggests that the Constitution adopt the crazy nationalist plan you ever heard of, where the president has all the power and the states are nothing. He says the states are just going to be little tiny corporations. They're basically going to be eradicated. And it's going to be like a whole big government, kind of like the king, except not the king. And the president will serve for life. And all the people in the Senate will serve for life. And the judges will serve for life. And he says, how about we have that as a plan? Now, some people think that Hamilton really wanted that, that Hamilton really wanted a constitutional monarchy, and that he gave that plan so that that was his true belief. And that's what Thomas Jefferson came to believe, that Alexander Hamilton was a secret monarchist. But I believe, and some other people, that they needed somebody to go in and suggest that the national plan that they had, that didn't wipe the states out, was kind of a moderate position, a sort of B position between A and C. And that Alexander Hamilton, who thought he was pretty smart, who already knew he didn't have any vote, who'd done all sorts of things that Washington had asked him, I think Alexander Hamilton went in and gave that speech because they needed somebody to basically be willing to almost sacrifice himself a little bit to make sure that the national plan wasn't completely lost. But that plan is why when Thomas Jefferson comes back from France, Thomas Jefferson hates Hamilton. And Hamilton will spend the rest of his life trying to explain that that plan was not really what he truly believed. And just to connect the dots, 
So who's Alexander Hamilton? He's there during the American Revolution at Washington's right side. He's an aide-de-camp. He's there at Valley Forge. He understands what happens when you can't pay the troops because there's no money in the coffers. They actually die, you know, and they, they, don't, they don't have shoes. They don't have food. Um, so he gets it in a way that Thomas Jefferson, who's off chasing women and drinking wine in Paris, doesn't quite get it. Um, and what does Alexander, I'm a Hamilton fan. He's not perfect, but um, boy, he's not perfect. Um, but what does he do in that last battle? He leads a bayonet charge. He, so take, talk about someone who's willing to take one for the team and be out there. He's, you know, he's in it for the glory. And, and even people who don't agree with him say, wow, the guy can give a speech. That, you know, he, he's actually a pretty impressive character. By the way, in that bayonet charge that he leads over Yorktown, he gets to pick the troops around him. I think, I haven't seen the, the Lin-Manuel uh, thing, but he picks uh, black people um, in part because they'll fight. And he, he actually believes that. Um, so, and there are many things that are complicated about all these characters, um, including Hamilton. Um, but um, uh, it's not complete. It, it, it is plausible to me that he might have done this as a sort of, you know, tactic the same way that he would be willing to, to sacrifice his body at Yorktown if that's what's needed to, to, to win the American Revolution. So we've talked about some of the uh, major issues that the delegates were, were grappling with during that four months in Philadelphia. Um, people from um, the Northeast had different regional concerns than people from, from the South. Um, they were, the people in the South were particularly interested and very worried about access to the port of New Orleans mm -hmm. um, because that would mean that's a way to get their goods out. Uh, you know, into the market, and I think that was still held by Spain, if my memory serves. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was an issue that they were dealing with. They were dealing with slavery as a major issue. Um, some people, uh, did anybody, by the way, in the convention raise slavery as a moral issue? Yep. And who was that? Yeah, so um, there, it's a person who doesn't, people don't often talk about him, um, but probably the person who most passionately felt bad about slavery and, and raised it was a person named Governor Morris, except his name looks like it would be pronounced Governor Your like that, but it's actually uh, Governor Morris. He had lost his leg. He, he had part of his leg. He was not married, and he was considered to be a little bit of a, um, <laughs> live, a good, live a good life. And so uh, he, a he hurt his leg. he'd hurt his leg in a carriage accident but he liked to put out that he'd lost it jumping out of a second story window uh, when a husband came in um, <laughs> thinking that he, he shouldn't be sleeping around with his wife, okay? And so, um, so he was a, he was a, he loved, he loved, um, uh, they loved jokes and everything like that. And, um, but Governor Morris felt that slavery was wrong. And in a speech that Madison writes down, he actually accuses Madison and the Southerners of basically creating a line over slavery. That, and, he, and he says at one moment, he says basically if slavery is going to be the line between the North and the South, which is what Madison had argued. Madison argued there's a line here between North and South. And Morris said no one's ever said that before, but if that's true, then we ought to take a leave of each other right now. Here's what he, another thing that he says. Um, and then he actually trades it away for other things. He's a lawyer, and lawyers sometimes talk a good game, but then they, they trade things away, unfortunately. Not, not any, you know, present company, of course, excluded. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but um, I, I teach in a law school, too. But here's one of the things he says. It's a direct quote. He's trying to show you just how horrible this thing is and how bad three-fifths, in fact, is, because it's rewarding bad behavior. The inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondages shall have more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizens of Pennsylvania or New Jersey who views with a horror so nefarious a practice. Domestic slavery is the most prominent feature in the aristocratic 
countenance of the proposed constitution. You claim that I, because Gouverneur Morris sort of is an aristocrat, actually slavery, he's very well born, is actually the most aristocratic feature of the thing. And, and, and you quote Elbridge Gerry saying, wait a minute, we don't get to count our horses and cattle, why are you counting these slaves? Um, we, you don't count all the, the wealth of New England, but you're counting the slaves of South Carolina. Um, there were others who said that too. And you know, we should point out, because it's sometimes easy to get the misunderstanding that only the South had slaves in 1787, but Massachusetts had slavery. We had slavery here up through the 1780s. You can go visit one of the only slave quarters in New England if you go out to Medford to the Isaac Royal House. In fact, in the 1750s, two African Americans held enslaved were accused of poisoning their master. And the woman was burned at the stake. That's not what they did to people accused falsely of, at Salem. They hung them. She was burned in Massachusetts. The man was hung, and then his body was put in a gibbet, what they did to pirates. And we know about that, one, from newspapers, and secondly, because when Paul Revere took his famous ride, he said, I rode past the place where that man hung, because his body hung there for so long. So in Massachusetts, we had slavery. Massachusetts slavery was ended by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1780. And the Supreme Judicial Court read the Massachusetts Constitution, passed by the people. And it said, when we read the words free and equal, we believe they mean that you cannot have slavery. Now, those same words were in the Virginia Constitution, so they understood people might have differing understandings about whether words and constitutions meant something. But the Massachusetts SJC in 1780 abolished slavery by judicial decision under the Massachusetts Constitution. And from that point on, Massachusetts, like gradually a number of the other states, began to get rid of slavery. The same clause of the Massachusetts Constitution, because you still have it, it's the oldest con con written constitution in continuous existence. It's older than the federal, it's 1780. That same clause, that everyone's born free and equal, was the clause that Margaret, Mar Chief Justice Margaret Marshall and a majority of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court um, in your lifetime used to say, there in, the, in a case called Goodrich, under our state constitution, there's a right to same-sex marriage. Massachusetts was the first state to do it before any of the others. The very same clause that had been used in 1783 in a couple of cases called Quack Walker and Holmes versus Jennison, interpreting that Massachusetts constitution in 1780. So you're part of a really amazing tradition. Now, Massachusetts isn't perfect. You got all these so-called cotton wigs. I mean, um, later on in the North, and they're financing their um, slavery. They're writing insurance contracts, and 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 they're uh, uh, underwriting them as uh, slavery uh, investments as as bankers. They're they're shipping slaves, northern shipping. And so so everyone is complicit, actually, and Lincoln is clear. But, but I do want to read you just one thing, because it's from here in Massachusetts. The first version of the Massachusetts Constitution, 1778, actually had a race test for voting. And people, when it was put to the states, they voted it down, and they gave reasons. And, here, and one of the reasons that some people voted down is they say, we shouldn't have a race test for voting in Massachusetts. And these are Massachusetts farmers. They're very tart, they're very sarcastic. Here's what they say. We rejected, quote, this is from, I don't know where Georgetown is. George, yeah. yeah. Okay, Boston. Georgetown. Rejected, this is May 25th, 1778. This is before the U.S. Constitution, state constitution. Rejected because a man being born in Africa, India, or ancient American, or even being much sunburnt, deprived him of having a vote for representative. So they're mocking the thing, like really, really you're gonna have a, like a skin test and, and if you get a, a sunburn, you know, you're gonna be counted as a non-voter or something. So they had a, a sense of humor, but there are people from the beginning up and down the continent who have views on one side and there are people who have views on the other side and then there are people who know it's wrong, but you can make some money off of it. That's your way of life. So we've talked about um, some of the major concerns that the delegates were grappling with. Um, but now the question is this. They were dealing with situations in, in uh, you know, 
the 1780s and 1790. Um, slavery was an issue. It's no longer an issue. Uh, women uh, were certainly relegated to second, if not third class citizens. That is uh, fortunately almost no longer the case. Um, uh, we have an equal protection clause. We have a 14th Amendment. The real issue now is, does any of it matter what the framers thought when we try to apply the Constitution to the issues that we're dealing with now today. Nikhil can go first. <laughs> uh, so one, um, and this is an area of overlap between um, Mary's book and mine, we are um, both very aware that everything that happened in Philadelphia was secret. She tells the story basically about how Madison eventually publishes the notes, but he makes all sorts of changes. Nothing that happened there was, was voted on, was ratified by the people. My story actually begins, most stories about the Constitution begin with Madison showing up um, at Philadelphia in early May in preparation for the convention. I, my story begins in late September of 1787, 230 years ago today, because that's when it went public when the people got to look at the proposal and decide whether they were for it or against it. Yes, no, we do, we don't. Um, and so I tend to look not so much at the framing, which was secret, but the ratification process, which is public. And the Federalist Papers, you see, they're public op-eds. And, you, you know, and they're saying, vote for it. Other people saying, no, vote against it. And my claim is, actually, the, the, the Federalist Papers that were most significant weren't the Federalist 10, which weren't written at the time, but actually fed, the early op-eds, culminating in eight, saying, we need this for geostrategic reasons. OK. So I look at the ratification, what we actually agreed to. I think that's important. As Mary and I have both said, you have to look at all the amendments because it's a totally different constitution today, you know, one with a Bill of Rights, anti-slavery rather than pro-slavery elements, women's suffrage, 18-year-olds, um, uh, so you have to look at, but if you do all of that, I actually wouldn't want us to, you know, forget about it because it says important stuff that, like freedom of speech, that I wouldn't want the government to be able to say, oh, that was a long time ago, you know, we don't really, you know, I wouldn't want, a president to just tweet out, you know, who cares about the First Amendment is very old, you know, because um, people died for that. And so um, I'll say one final thing. If you read the Ninth Amendment, which is part of the Bill of Rights, which talks about unenumerated rights, I'd be of the view that the Constitution says there can be more rights than the ones we wrote down, but not less. And I want, want to know why they wrote down a Seventh Amendment because you heard that actually it was about civil trial, maybe we're not doing justice to it. Or a Fourth Amendment, why we have a right against unreasonable searches and seizures, because this is a James Otis form, and, and, and he was important in, in the ramp up to the Fourth Amendment, the famous writs of assistance controversy and, and, and other things. I want you to know why we have a First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, free exercise of religion and the like. I, want you to, I would want us to have all of those rights, and they'd be at least as broad as they were originally understood by the people who adopted and ratified them, not behind closed doors, but who ratified them. I want them to be at least as broad. But the Ninth Amendment says there are unenumerated rights as well. So I'm just going to take issue. It's not fair. But Julie actually said, you know, 10% of the people say right to have a pet is in the Bill of Rights. I actually have a book. I, I didn't know that that, that was going to come up. Um, but it's called America's Unwritten Constitution. And one chapter actually talks about, among other things, all these unenumerated rights, like the right to have a pet dog, the mm -hmm. right to play a fiddle, the right to wear a hat, you know, the right to raise your family. Actually, courts do protect these. These are unenumerated rights. So I would say more rights rather than less. And evolution, um, as society evolves, yes, I would say you can have more rights, but I wouldn't want you to have less. If you're going to have less, we have to amend the Constitution. It took a lot of sweat and blood to put these things in there. Let's not lose them lightly. So I might be, in that sense, more of an originalist type than, than Mary, but I'll let her speak for herself. Yeah, so I, so I, you know, I was trained as, in, as a lawyer, but also as a historian. Whoops, and now you're not going to be able to hear me. I can see the person who's doing this being like, she needs to put her mic back on. Um, so I, this is what I think. I think that when we look backwards, we see the Constitution a certain way. Because 
the way if you lo lead your life backwards, it all makes sense to you. Right. But we know going forwards, there's so many choices. So I think a lot of the way we understand our Constitution is the product of 225 years living under the Constitution, including the very notion of a Constitution. So I'm not an originalist in the sense of like there's only one legitimate way to understand the Constitution, and that's what it meant at the time it was written or ratified, because I'm not sure they had the foggiest idea they didn't even know how many people were going to be on the Supreme Court or what a Supreme Court would be. They didn't know how it was going to be amended or anything like that. But I think that's different from understanding the history. And I think understanding the history is incredibly important in making sense of the Constitution and understanding what I think is two of the most important aspects of the Constitution. One, they were trying desperately to stabilize and protect the country. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes I go out and, and people say, well, don't you think we should really have a new Constitution? And I'm like, no, not really. Because basically, I think if you think about the Constitution at its most fundamental level as a Constitution to stabilize and protect the country, it does a pretty good job of that. Because it was written at a very high level. Right? And secondly, I think I'm always like, the second most important thing is that the preamble says, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. And they wrote a letter to Congress. There's one letter that says what they actually thought they were doing. And it echoes this notion of more perfect. They did not think they'd done everything right. They never said this was a perfect document. They never said everybody can never touch it. They said we tried our best but we understand there are things that might be difficult. In their own lifetime, they amended it. And they created a court Ten with times, a lot of them on it times. that tried to interpret it. So I personally think everybody should memorize the preamble. Like I would love to have everybody forced to memorize the preamble because I think it reminds us that we're always trying to be a more perfect union, and that is in the Constitution itself. And since Mary talked about whether you guys are going to vote next time, and here's the point, even if you, know, you don't just have a right to vote, maybe you have a duty to vote. It, no matter what the drinking age, you don't have a duty to drink, okay? Um, you actually have a duty to vote. People died for this, just like you have a duty to serve on a jury when you're called, and and your generation's gonna decide what the 28th Amendment will be or won't be, and the 29th and the 30th. Um, and that's why I pulled out my, my wallet here, because you look on the back, that's why the pyramid is unfinished. It's always gesturing upwards. It's never finished, it's never perfect. Here's what I will tell you. Almost all the amendments have actually made the thing better. They've made amends. They've actually expanded liberty and equality, with the exception maybe of prohibition, which you know, was, uh, actually was repealed. The 18th Amendment was repealed by the 21st, but, but the Bill of Rights adds all these rights, and then we get rid of slavery, we, the people, and then we promise e um, uh, um, equal citizenship and black suffrage and woman suffrage, and we get rid of um, poll tax disfranchisement in my lifetime in an 18-year-old vote. The amendments have actually made amends for some of the sins uh, and lapses. They've, they've made it better. It's more perfect, but it, could be, it's, it, it can be more perfect still. And that's why you guys are here, because you can't actually build on the pyramid unless you actually know what, it, you know, what its shape um, is thus far, where it came from, you know, what it seems to be pointing toward, what would perfect it further. This is probably a good time to open up uh, for questions from the floor. P please feel free to come down to uh, either of the two microphones. Um, and while you're doing that, I would like uh, either or both of you to, to sort of set forth the, the spectrum between the original uh, intent or original understanding uh, view of interpreting a constitution as we have it and, uh, and sort of the living constitution. Judge Posner. Wait, wait, first of all, I see no one going to the microphones. So people have to go. I have um, uh, 12 and 15 year old daughters. Professor Amar has what, 16? 16, 16, 16, 18. 18. We spent a lot of our lives explaining at home, you know, like this and that and everything like that. And my, and my, my daughter's always like, they asked for questions, but I wasn't going to be that person, okay? So <laughs> I expect, I want a big long line. When else do yeah. you get to just ask a question? So. Okay, great. Well, um, so before we get to that, we do have some questions, and we have two people over here. 
So you have to turn, okay, Julia's doing that, I guess, for you. Um, you'll have to turn on the microphone before we, uh, before we begin. I'm going to ask you to give us your first name and the school that you're from, and then state your question, please. All right, so this is on, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> I'm Maeve. I'm from Nantucket High School. Um, I was just going to go back to when you were talking about the Electoral College and how, um, like, the three-fifths was affecting, like, positively slave states. Yes. And, like... You were sort of going into how that was affecting us today and how the Electoral College affected us today with how our president um, won the vote, though he didn't actually have the majority of the votes. And mm -hmm. could you just further describe that for us? So why do we have the Electoral College? And your generation, if it wants, can amend it out of the Constitution or not. You have a right but not a duty to amend. And you can't discharge that unless you know why we have it. So you need to know the history in some uh, ways. So Mary <coughs> talked about you know, women and voting. Think about it this way. In a world, let's, it's 1900. And some states are letting women vote. Um, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Idaho. Other states aren't. Okay? It's 1900. Now... In an electoral college world, it doesn't matter whether you let women vote or not in Massachusetts. Same number of electoral votes from Massachusetts. But now, if you had a direct election world, you, you didn't. But if you had one, well, if Massachusetts lets its women vote, it's just doubled its clout in the national election. There would actually have been incentives to make it easier to vote because now your state's playing a big role. People are disfranchised today. In North Carolina, they were disfranchised in the last election. Um, in 2000, in Florida. Well, in an electoral college world, the state doesn't take a hit when it does that. In a direct election world, one party still might be trying to suppress the vote in some ways, but the state as a whole would have an interest in pumping up the vote because the more people vote from, pick your state, North Carolina, Florida, Massachusetts, the more clout North Carolina, Florida, Massachusetts would be having in the national so, um, um, count. So, so these things sort of are with us today. You have to decide whether you like them or not. How many of you have heard of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact? It's this kind of weird, screwy system. Um, kind of weird. But states could choose. You seem to like it. Um, um, states, um, if they want, could choose to give the electoral votes, let's say in Massachusetts, not the person who wins Massachusetts, but to the person who wins the national popular vote. I'll now, just, can I just say, because just, uh, just to show you people can disagree also, so I grew up in Wisconsin and still in my heart of hearts, that's where I am. Until we get to the Super Bowl and it's like the Packers versus the Patriots and then I have split loyalties. But for me, and I totally agree with Professor Amar about the history and the problematics of the Electoral College, but there's a little part of me that worries a lot about a world where the biggest, most populous places become the only way that the United States gets defined. And so there's a little part of me that likes some of the mechanisms in the original Constitution that balance for smaller states, places where people are more diffuse, the politics of that. So now you see that's, for you, that's the debate for your generation. You can't even sort of weigh in you know, unless you know. And you see, my utterly devastating response to, to <laughs> Professor Builder on that is, well, if that's so, then Massachusetts is pretty darn stupid because we actually don't pick governors in Massachusetts by giving Otis and Lee some sort of extra clout or something. And boy, we're pretty damn stupid in Texas, you know, because we don't give extra clout to some little counties there. And we're pretty darn stupid in California and Pennsylvania and in every other state. Call us crazy, but here's how we do it. We count up all the votes, one person, one vote, and if it's close, we recount them care um, carefully. Call us crazy, but that's how we do it in America. And I just did one other move, you see. I'm showing you how a lot of what's in the federal constitution is an interesting conversation with what the states are doing. This is a theme that you see when you read the Philadelphia Convention, Time and time again, someone says, well, back home, here's how we do it this way. Remember I said, well, 
you know, you're going to put it to a vote because Massachusetts put it to a vote. You're going to have bicameralism and a separate um, uh, executive and a separate judiciary because that's how Massachusetts does it. You're going to give your chief executive a veto pen because that's how Massachusetts does it. People say you should have a Bill of Rights because a bunch of states do. So there's this very interesting conversation between states and the federal constitution. And if her argument was a good one, and it's not, you see. <laughs> Um, then every single state is picking its governor the wrong way. I mean, I do think that this will be the constitutional issue probably for your generation. One of them is going to be the Electoral College, and my guess is, is that Professor Amar's side wins on this, that the arc pushes towards popular um, voting for the president, straight up popular voting in the same way that the senators used to be picked by state legislatures and now are direct um, election. So I think history pushes that direction. Just little people like me from little rural states still like the other way. You get your one vote just <laughs> like, you know, the, the little person from the suburb, just like the little person from um, Southie. Everyone gets one vote. One person, one vote. No matter, you know, black, green, male, female, uh, rural, urban, one person, one vote. Thank is, you very much. Is there Thank an you. issue, though, um, that that may discourage, actually, people from small states from participating in the electoral process? I think that's what I'm hearing from Professor Bilt. Well, right now, you know, if you're talking about discouragement, people in California don't vote because it's always going to be blue, and people in Texas don't vote because it's always going to be red. So if you actually are talking about discouragement, there, there are five states that are in play. In 2012, only four states were decided by five points or, or less, North Carolina, Virginia, um, Ohio, and, and Florida. Um, they tend to be generally where North meets South, um, because that's the big division in America, which James Madison understood. And you say, Florida, Professor? Yeah, because all these New Yorkers are moving down to Florida to retire. So demographically, that's where <laughs> North meets South. And in Florida, the further South you go, the more North it feels, demographically. Um, so um, right now, a whole bunch of people never show up because their states aren't in play. That's probably actually true in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, presidentially, is basically going to be blue. So, but in a direct election world, it actually matters whether the Democrat, um, whether his name is John Kerry or her name is, is Hillary Clinton, carries Massachusetts 53-47 or carries Massachusetts 60-40. Um, it would matter a lot because every vote would sort of count. Um, so it actually, the argument would go, would actually be better overall for turnout. Okay. Yes, sir. Your name, please. Hello, my name is Nicholas Adams. I go to Pembroke High School, and I'd like to discuss the topic of centralization versus decentralization of government. Uh, earlier, you were talking about the Constitution as a sort of pseudo-New World government, and I wanted to talk about even bring it a little farther into the more recent past, like uh, after World War I with Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. Uh, it had kind of both aspects of centralization and decentralization with uh, bringing the states together in a compact, or, or bringing all the nations together in a compact, yet giving sovereignty to individual peoples. Uh, do you see, yet there's all these kind of trends today as well, like the European Union, is it going to become a super state or is it going to fall apart? Do you see the world as a centralizing or a decentralizing world and humanity as centralizing or decentralizing in the modern day? Wow, that's a spectacular question. You've got it just right. The, the analogs to the Articles of Confederation are stuff like NATO, the EU, the United Nations, its precursor League of Nations. Um, and, the, and the articles didn't work so well. In the end, they kind of failed. One interesting question is whether your generation is not only going to be thinking about amendments to the American Constitution, but whether you know, we need stronger um, um, regional and world systems or whether we're not ready for that at all as a world. Those are the challenges, I think, of, of your generation. Um, and, and Europe right now is undergoing something that anyone who studied the Articles Confederation would see as you know, very familiar. Uh, Brexit, for example. Well, that's you know, Rhode Island saying, well, we're going to go our own way, or North Carolina saying, we're going to go our own way, South Carolina at all moments saying, threatening to go 
um, their own way. So, so yes, you've got it just right when you see the analogies between things today like NATO, EU, UN, or the League of Nations, and these um, um, earlier uh, things like the Articles Confederation. I mean, I'm not going to, he's the one who brought up aliens, so I'm going <laughs> to let him talk about international stuff. I, I do think one of the things that's interesting about the world today that, that's a little bit different from certainly the world um, 225 years ago is that however governments are internationally, one of the really incredible global phenomena is the way in which um, information and access to information, access to news, access to things like that um, has created, I think, a popular kind of similarities in some places. And, um, and so I, I think that makes it a little bit different in the world that I spend time in in the 1770s, 1760s. You know, it was very unlikely that people would go somewhere else or they knew about what was happening somewhere else in the way that you can be a person who never leaves your home in whatever area you are, and yet you know an enormous amount about what's going on in the world. And so, so there's a piece of this that's how actual governments get structured, but there's also an interestingly like centralization of culture globally um, that's very different from this earlier world. Here, here's a way of putting it. Um, how many of you are um, planning to, to uh, pursue uh, edu higher education after um, high school? You're going to go to junior college or college? Raise your hands. Wonderful. Now, in America, if you go to college, you're going to actually meet people from around the world. Um, uh, my parents are born in undivided India, both of them. They meet at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. That's where I'm born. Um, you know, that's where Barack, Barack Obama's parents, you know, one from Africa with African roots and, and one with European roots, they meet at an American university. America is increasingly the world where maybe the one nation where m more of the great grandchildren of all the other peoples of the world actually come together than any other, more than uh, Switzerland, more than Germany, more than France, more than India or J J Japan or, 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 or China. Um, and, um, and Professor Bill just right, at the founding, most people live or die in like a 50-mile radius or something. But the Philadelphia Convention is interesting that way. It's, it's ahead of its time. Who is Alexander Hamilton? He's like a scholarship kid, you know, coming from, you know, this rock in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We haven't talked about him. Who writes the words, we the people? He's a lawyer named James Wilson, the, by acclamation, one of the greatest lawyers of, of his era. He's one of the first six justices on the Supreme Court. He writes both, the, he signs both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Who's he? He's a scholarship kid from Scotland. So, so the Philadelphia Convention folks are kind of globalists before their time. They are people, um, um, of the 39 people who signed the Constitution, Eight are foreign, uh, seven are foreign born, you see. Of the first 10 justices on the Supreme Court, three are foreign born. Um, of the first six secretaries of um, the Treasury, four are foreign born, including Hamilton and Gallatin. So, so um, uh, the, the elites actually were sort of more global um, uh, and, and a precursor of where we are moving today. Great, thanks, great question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, Jessica Clavio, um, so hi. Uh, okay, so um, with the recent controversy of the taking down of the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville and like all that came out of it and the conversation that has come up, um, a lot of the, that conversation has come up about like who we idolize as American <coughs> heroes. Like uh, in here in Boston, uh, peop some people want to rename the Faneuil Hall because the guy that was named after was a slave owner. And, but uh, we still kind of idolize, uh, say, George Washington, who was a slave owner. Um, what do you think about this kind of like gray area of who we as a nation define as American heroes and who we think are American villains and how we can sometimes cherry pick uh, who we want to see as heroes and villains? Yeah, it's a great question. Let me, I'll, I'll answer it a little bit obliquely by talking about um, something that's happening tonight. I think one of the biggest problems with 
this whole area is that we have insufficiently memorialized people in the past who were African American or women and put their statues in all sorts of places. Because if all their statues were there, then all the other statues, first of all, there wouldn't be as many of them. Because you couldn't have that many statues. And so I'll give you a great example. Um, tonight, um, a great lawyer, uh, Walter Prince, who's African American, very important figure, is getting an award from this organization, and it's called the Robert Morris Award. And I know a lot about Morris because we did an exhibit about Morris. Um, Morris was African American. He was the second lawyer in the United States. He, was, he lived in the early part of the 19th century. He was a great trial lawyer. He single-handedly, over and over again, tried to defend the rights of African Americans in the era before the Civil War. He did all sorts of things. He also represented the Irish when they had no lawyers. In fact, he represented so many of the Irish that he became known as the Irish um, lawyer. He's near and dear to my heart because uh, he gave his books to Boston College because he was very um, close to the Jesuits who founded it. Now, he's a great American lawyer. He's a great Boston lawyer. He's a great Massachusetts lawyer. Most people have never heard of him. And um, we need more statues of people like that. So that's on the inclusion side. You were also asking, well, should we tear stuff down or not? A um, couple of things. One, Yale thought about this a lot. And there was an excellent report uh, uh, written by a dear friend of mine, a colleague. His name is John Witt, W-I-T-T. And you might want to look at it, because he sets forth general principles for how to think about naming. Um, he's connected to our conversation, because he won the, you know, the, one of the most distinguished um, historians award there is, which is called the Bancroft Prize. And so did <laughs> Professor Builder, you see. Um, and he says, here are some principles. One, the question is in part, it's about um, um, honoring folks, which is a little different. We don't want to whitewash history, so even if you say you get rid of the honor of, a, you know, you don't want to destroy the statue, maybe you put it in a museum where we can think about it and talk about it. So you don't want to whitewash history, but there's a question of whom we choose to honor, both whom we're not honoring that we should, are we honoring people that we shouldn't? That's the even edgier part. She doesn't like edgy things as much. I'll, I'll always go for, you know, I'll grasp that net also. Um, here are some other things that John Witt says. We have to be, think, historically. We have to understand people in their context mm -hmm. and not as, um, by the standards of today. What was and wasn't in their time sort of controversial and open to us. I eat meat. I'm actually not proud of it. I, you know, I think it's probably not right. Um, what will people 300, 230 years from now think of that? You know, it's very easy for us to judge them, but you know, Lincoln very famously in his second inaugural says, you know, Judge not that ye be not judged, quoting the scriptures. Um, third thing that John Witt says is, you know, and I don't think about it in context, but the good and the bad. Yeah, George Washington was a slaveholder, but he was a lot of other things too. Mm -hmm. um, John C. Calhoun only had two ideas, and they were both bad ones, stupid ones, secession, um, which is treason, um, and slavery being a good thing. Uh, my kids, you know, sometimes they say, you know, turn down that rap music, it's all swear words or something, and they said, Dad, Shakespeare used swear words. And I said, yes, but Shakespeare used other words too, okay? He didn't just use swear words. So everyone did, has done bad stuff, but is that the only thing? See, John C. Calhoun, that's the only thing that he basically did. Robert E. Lee, basically, yeah, he, was, he served his country before he turned traitor, you know, and he celebrated, um, and, and, and he was fighting for a, a pro-slavery cause, and I'm not sure he should actually have public statue, statues with my tax dollars, and I wouldn't want to tear that down and destroy it, turn it into, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, as they pulled down the statue of George III in New York City and, and made bullets out of it. No, that should be in a museum so we can think about it and contextualize it, and it is more complicated than, than I did. So she's saying in you know, Richmond, Virginia, put up you know, a statue of uh, Arthur Ashe. That's great. That's the inclusionary side. But we are going to have conversations about renaming, denaming Calhoun College. These uh, now in Charlottesville. One final thing: it's, they've got a new president of the University of Virginia. He's actually right here in, in 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 this locality right now. His name is Jim Ryan. He's dean of the Harvard School of Education. He's a very great man, um, and he's going to need all the help 
he can get thinking these things through. One good place for him to start, for you to start, and it's on the internet, it's not very long, is to read the WIT report, W-I-T-T. -T. Let me, I just have to say one more thing, because I, I really care about putting up statues for women, because I think what you believe you can become it's what your environment tells you you can become. And when everywhere you go, there are statues of white guys on horses, and you don't happen to be a white guy on a horse, you're like, what can I become? So I think the fact that you go to Central Park and there's statues of the women is Alice in Wonderland or whatever, I just think that's outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And there was a movement to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill so there would at least be one woman, an African-American person, on a piece of money. Right, a, Professor Amar pulls out the dollar bills. There's no people who look like a lot of Americans on that money. And so I really believe very strongly, you know, some of the statues were put up in the last 50 years. I've got no sympathy for those whatsoever. Statues that come from a very long time ago that are part of their own history, that's, I think, a harder question. Statues of losers of a war that was lost, I have very little sympathy for. But more than anything, I think we need many, many more things to commemorate people who actually existed, participated in this we the people, so that all of us can believe we can become all sorts of great things. I want to live to see a woman be president. Okay? I want to live to see all sorts of people be president. I have this dish towel of the presidents of the United States. And like, except for their facial hair, some of them have beards, some of them have mustaches, they all basically look the same. Right? And I think, you know, in your lifetime that needs to change so that all kids who are born in the United States can walk around thinking maybe someday I can be president, have the cool thing, fly on Air Force One, all that cool stuff. The um, 19th Amendment, which we did mention, is known colloquially as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. People talked about it at the time when they ratified the Anthony Amendment, and she is on a coin, that's, but that's an example of, of how you know, wi women actually played a huge role in the leadership of the 19th Amendment, and uh, I'm not sure there's a, there are enough statutes commemorating the likes of Susan B. who also, by the way, um, was a defendant in a very interesting jury trial where for the first time ever, the judge directed the jury to enter a verdict of guilty, but she see the, the lawyers say judges can't do that in criminal cases, and they and Susan B. Anthony so pressed pushed the buttons of this judge, he did something that was completely lawless in a case involving jury trial, and it was all men on the jury, of course. Good. Um, well, before uh, we leave, maybe um, I'd like to talk about one of my favorite women heroes, and that's Mercy Otis Warren. Another another um, person from Great Massachusetts. About, one. Yeah, I mean, she was. Um, you know, instrumental in the founding uh, with the, the Columbia Patriot and so forth. But I see we have a lot of questions here. We want well, to I'll, just say, I'll just say one more thing about that. So Mercy Otis Warren, there's all these Federalist papers, and they were all written anonymously, so they're all anonymous. We don't know who wrote any of them. But everybody said, well, they had to be all men. We know Mercy Otis Warren wrote one. We only know that because she wrote a friend, I wrote that one. Personally, I suspect there are others. I do not believe she's the only woman to ever write one, or she wrote, we know many women wrote things that they published under their husband's names. So she's a perfect example of a woman who deserves much more credit in her own right, but who also in her own lifetime had to be anonymous. This is uh, connected to James Otis. She's James Otis's sister. He's a great um, uh, trial lawyer. The pamphlet <laughs> is uh, called A Columbian Patriot, and until the 1920s or 30s, the pamphlet got attributed to a man, men getting more credit than they deserve, Elbridge Gary, another great man, vice president from, from this state, and it was one of her descendants, Charles Warren, actually, who actually said, actually, it was my great, great, great you know, ancestor, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, who really deserves the credit. Her book, Professor Builder's book, is doing a lot of stuff like that, basically looking more carefully at the archival records and actually saying what we thought we knew isn't quite so. We thought this was Elbridge Gary, but in fact, it's Mercy Otis Warren. And, and if you want to see a lot more of stuff like that, read Madison's Hand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name's Laura O'Hanlon, and I'm from Milton High. Um, uh, the preamble says, like, we the people. Um, 
in creating the con Constitution, there was like a lot of debate about whether it was should be we the people or we the states. Do you think that the Electoral College today re reflects the states' rights view of we the states, even though we put in place a more central government reflecting we the people? Yeah, I mean, I, I love one of my favorite stories about that is, you know, there's two theories of why the states get dropped out. The states, in one of the early drafts, all the states' names are, you know, it says we the people in order to form, and there's all the states' names. And there's two theories about why that gets dropped, and personally, I think they're probably both true. There's a pragmatic theory, which you didn't know which states were going to ratify. The convention only needed nine. Um, Wouldn't it be uh, embarrassing if you listed Rhode Island and, and Rhode Island turns <laughs> yes. out to, yeah. in the first sentence, and Rhode Island turns out not to, to, you know, to join? But then there's another reason, and I think this is also the reason, which is they have begun in the course of the convention to realize that the states can't be destroyed, but, but this is no longer a state-centered, state-sovereign document. And I, think, and I think both of those go together. I agree. You know, and I think the Electoral College, in some ways, is the last vestige of that world. Well, so. one of the two last vestiges, and you're sitting in the other one. You know, because sure. why should California, you know, um, be treated this? I mean, Rhode Island, really? You know, so, um, and it's an example of how even though their world is really different from ours, um, and maybe that doesn't make sense anymore, it says two per state, and it still is two per state. And maybe it was two per state for all sorts of utterly contingent reasons, like... Um, you don't have a census yet, so you know unless you actually have two, per, you know, equal. You don't even know how much Virginia is really entitled to. And on day one, um, if you if it's going to be population, you're going to have to figure on day one how to count slaves and how are you going to even vote about how you vote. You know, Philadelphia Convention is actually one state, one vote at Philadelphia. But if really that's the wrong way of doing it, if Virginia should be having more votes at Philadelphia itself, but how do you decide that? By what voting rule do you decide that voting rule? So for completely silly, there hadn't been, been a sense yet, contingent reasons, arguably. You know, we've got this one, you know, equal um, representation of states in, um, in, in the Senate. It's a vestige of the Articles of Confederation, um, but it's still around. So I would say that's another big one and, and probably here to stay. I mean, I think this is, we always talk in my, in my class, I teach law students, about sort of like, where do you think you're from? Like, what do you identify as? And, um, and most people identify, like, with some place that will make them interesting. So, like, if they're from here, they identify where they were born or something like that. So how many people have lived in another state than Massachusetts? How many people are hoping to live over the course of their lifetime in another state than Massachusetts? Okay, that's the vast majority of people. And I think this is one of the things is we live in a much more mobile world, and so the degree to which that wasn't the, the, founding. the state mm -hmm. makes sense in the same way may, may fade. And in fact, that's why a lot of federal programs now send money back to states, but there's a lot of programs that do it on a non-state basis. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, and Madison, of course, uh, argued for proportionate representation in the Senate originally and was pretty upset, I learned in your book, when he lost on that. Yeah, and, he didn't like the states at all. And n n this book really emphasizes in ways that others haven't, and I just want to commend it. That's all for Madison and for other people connected up with slavery, too. See, because, yeah, we're going to move away from equality, but how much does Virginia get? And Madison wants Virginia to get more than Pennsylvania and more than Massachusetts. And she told us the main difference is not the, the, in the number of voters or, or free people, white people. The main difference is Virginia has all these slaves and it wants to count them. It's getting extra credit because it's holding people in bondage and that's Madison's, that's what Madison is pushing for, and you can't forget that. And until, I think, the recent generation, the slavery angle on the whole thing really got um, uh, suppressed. Uh, suppressed. Let's see if we can, oh, we got to ask, we got to answer quicker so yep. we can get through more people. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Justin, and I'm from Carver Middle High School. It's next to Plymouth. Um, and I don't want to get into, like, aliens and conspiracies and anything, but as the world progresses, 
the United States is moving from an isolationist movement set by Monroe in like around 1825 to a more global community, and that could be partly due to the internet and easy communication across the planet. And I was wondering where you think the line should be drawn for the people in the United States to lose some privileges in order to benefit the global community, seeing as it's easier to communicate now. I mean, in some ways, you could argue we were global in the beginning. I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that um, Washington is in Philadelphia, but John Adams is in England, where he thinks it's really important to be. Thomas Jefferson's in France. And a huge percentage of what they're arguing about, and Professor Amar's book does this wonderfully, is sort of geostrategic. How does the United States fit into that, into that global world? And I, and I do think this is where um, a lot of things that um, are connected now in our lifetime were not connected in their lifetime and really changed things. So in their lifetime, um, you know, you can do a lot of things within the borders of the United States, and a, a certain percentage of those aren't going to affect anybody else, right? Nowadays, we know if you do certain things, have certain kinds of factories here, you're hurting somebody somewhere else in the world. And so that connectedness that we know about, it was true in their lifetime, but they didn't know about it changes that equation, I think, somewhat. We have time for just two more questions, but I will say that Professor Amar and Professor Bilden will be outside, or we may hear, but outside in the back, we have some refreshments as well um, for more discussion. Um, but uh, two more questions, and yes, sir. Hi, Hi. so my name's Kelvin. I um, <clears throat> attend Millen High School. So given the recent like events going on in the world, um, you know, mainly here in the United States, um, they seem to be reoccurring in a, in a major way, like similar to right before the Civil War. And one of the main reasons uh, Southerners, well, the Civil War started is because Southerners believed that um, they, they, were, they were defending their state's rights. They, were, they felt that um, the Northerners were treating them like poorly and they were being unconstitutional. So given the events that's been happening recently and how it looks like it can be steering in that same path, do you think that the Constitution can ever actually be not perfected, but like, cl like close enough so that it's like it's not the same reoccurring, like over and over again? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say one thing, and then I'll let Professor Amar, who's written quite a bit about this, say. So, um, I mean, I do think that there were Southerners who fought for the Confederacy, who had come to believe that they were vo vo fighting for something called states' rights. But I think they were wholly mistaken, because if you look at the Confederate Constitution, the, the, only a slight overstatement to say the only thing that distinguishes the, Feder the Confederate Constitution from the US Constitution is that it protected the right to hold people in slavery. So people who held people in slavery, that's what they were fighting for. Now, did they persuade some people who didn't own people that they were fighting for something? Yes. But I think, it was a, I think there was a complete myth about this that then has come down to us as a myth about states' rights. I, you know, I teach the Confederate Constitution. I would tell everybody, go out, look at the Confederate Constitution, compare it to the U.S. Constitution, and the one thing you will see is that it repeatedly, over and over again, says explicitly, this Constitution is about the right to own other people people who are not white. So fundamentally, I think that's a fundamental difference between the two. And look at their ordinances of session and their reasons, and it's slavery, slavery, slavery. They're not able to say jury trials are being violated the way the Declaration of Independence said. We're being taxed without being represented, which is what the Declaration of Independence said. People are sending armies to kill us, which is what the Declaration of Independence said. So, so when you read the ordinance of secession, it really is all, all about slavery. As to your larger point, America is now and really always has been, and James Madison said it at Philadelphia, and Professor Builder's book talks about it, it's divided north against south. The three big divisions in America are not big state, small state. Big states don't have that much in common. Florida, Texas, California, New York vote very differently. Small states don't have that much in common. Rhode Island is very different than Alaska, is very different from Delaware. So um, America doesn't divide big state, small state. It divides north against, and always has, uh, divided north against south, which Madison talks about, coasts against the, the center, um, uh, um, which is why she was playing that uh, Wisconsin card, 
um, and um, <laughs> Cities Against the Hinterland, which is why she was also playing you know, the, the rural card. That's actually, those are the big divisions in America today. They've always been the big divisions in America. But we have to hold together, it seems to me, um, and that's what the Civil War was all about, keeping true this very important idea of union uh, on which a lot of our liberty really does depend. Can I, I'll just say one more thing, which is I think one of the hardest things and I think things that this last couple generations of scholars and historians have really worked to understand is that there was a slavery system here, yes. but it was a system that created a set of racial hierarchies and even when we get rid of slavery in the 13th and 14th Amendments, we still live in that world in which there are racial hierarchies out there. So we have not dealt with that. And I think that what you see around us today is um, a lot of the, the fact that some people want to believe very optimistically, like, oh, it's all behind us. We solved all those problems. And other people spend their lives living out the fact that we still live in a situation which for many people is segregated and we really haven't dealt with that very well at all still. Thank so you. last question um, for now. Okay, hello, my name is David. I'm from Hanover High School. And uh, I saw you guys mentioned a lot about uh, slavery and how it's, you say it's central to the US Constitution. What then explains the absence of the direct mention of slavery, the more you know, roundabout ways they try to find a way to fit, fit in mentions of slavery? What, exp what do you think is the reason why they didn't include slavery directly worded in the Constitution? Two things, just like she said, well, there are two theories for why it says we the people, not we the states. The kind of the practical one, if you list them and Rhode Island doesn't ratify, that looks stupid, and they actually aren't nationalist. So uh, two reasons, the, um, the practical one is that's not gonna help you actually in Massachusetts and other places to broadcast this. Um, there are people in Massachusetts that actually complain that actually um, they're going to be taxed too much because it's uh, three-fifths. Um, but not understanding it's not about tax because that would say that it should be, you know, um, five-fifths, the Southern should pay. They're fighting the last war they think is about taxation with that representation. So, so, so one, the cynical uh, theory is it's actually going to sort of um, help you get it ratified um, to, to kind of keep this on the down low. It's going to... Um, if you highlight slavery, it's going to hurt you in the North. And the other reason is they actually know it's wrong. M M Madison knows it's wrong. He, he's a hypocrite. Um, S S Jefferson, they, they know it's wrong. And that's what's so bad about people like John C. Calhoun, you see, because they don't think it's wrong, actually. They actually say, oh, slavery is a very good thing. There should be more of it, you know. Yeah, um, we're taking people from Africa. We're Christianizing them. What could be better? So, but I would say the idealistic point is they actually... The, the, most of the slaveholders do think it, it's wrong. I'm going to um, uh, let Mary uh, talk I'll, about I'll, tell, I'll say one thing that's like this while Professor Amar is looking up something. Um, it's not the only place where they omit the word slavery. So in the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson had a, uh, um, a provision in there about slavery. You can go and look it up. It's fascinating. It's completely convoluted. Yes. It's sort of half against slavery and half fear that people who are enslaved will rise up yeah. against and have blaming the British, and they cut it completely. So I do think there's, um, and people at the time um, interpreted that, some people interpreted it as an example of them being sneaky and trying to hide slavery, and other people interpreted it as a statement on the side of liberty and equality, and I think the fact that the word slave doesn't appear in the US Constitution, unbelievably important in terms of giving us some hope that some parts of that document were always intended to not continue that world. And that's why the Southern Constitution, uh, the Confederate Constitution, is so markedly different in its explicit use of that word. So Professor we talked about Martin. Hamilton, we talked about James Wilson, we of course talked about James Madison and George Washington, Ben Franklin has come up. Here's a guy named George Mason. He owns more slaves than anyone else at Philadelphia. He actually refuses to sign at the very end and he thinks slavery is wrong, even though he owns more slaves than anyone else. And he's seeing what slavery is doing to his own kids. He has nine or ten. It's making them bad human beings, little Kim Jong-uns, who, you know, actually are um, doing horrible things to other human beings. Slavery actually is bad for the slave master's soul. Here's what he says. These are pretty much quotes and paraphrases. Um, he talks about the evil of having slaves and blames slavery for, this is a long quote, 
discouraging arts and manufacturers, dampening the immigration of uh, whites, making citizens vulnerable to wartime sabotage and insurrection, and warping the very souls of masters, each of whom is born a petty tyrant. Providence, um, slavery, quote, brings the judgment of heaven on a country. Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. This is actually bad. It's going to be the death of us. We should get rid of it. It's a haunting uh, precursor of Lincoln's second inaugural second address, which actually says we're maybe being punished for God for our sins. You know, that, why are we having this um, civil war? So there were many people at Philadelphia who were slaveholders but who thought it was fine. My analogy would be like people who smoke. They don't really like smoking. They know it's kind of bad and disgusting. They're addicted, but they're addicted. They can't quit, but they actually don't want their grandkids to start, um, which is this historical sensibility that we can understand them. We can understand them in context. If we're really, really wise, we can learn not only from our own mistakes, but for some of theirs. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you all very much. Um, we are out of time. Now we can continue this conversation um, out in the foyer where we have some crackers and cheese and some uh, soft drinks. Um, first of all, uh, let me express again my, my thanks to Professor Bilda and Professor Amar for just a terrific afternoon. And uh, written it <laughs> Thanks to you. It's, uh, it's been a real treat to uh, listen to and learn from you both. I want to thank uh, also Julie Silverbrook with Consource for uh, co-sponsoring us and have us streaming live here. This is great. Thank you very much, Consource. <laughs> and Richard Middleton from the American Board of Trial Advocates uh, President Foundation for our, our co-sponsoring as well. I will leave you with this one uh, thought, which is uh, uh, given to us uh, by Franklin. And uh, there's some symmetry here, as uh, Julie, when she started, came up with a, a, one of Franklin's favorite quotes. Franklin liked to be sort of considered himself the sage, um, sometimes with a wry smile on his face, others not. But um, the day before the Constitution, the day the Constitution was to be signed, there were people like Mason and uh, like Elbridge Gerry who had been there for the whole time and, are, and were refusing to sign. And Franklin wrote out a, a speech in which he pleaded for everybody to sign. Uh, and he gives us all some, some good advice. And his, his wisdom and his words here may be good for all of us and for those uh, uh, further on uh, in the American political <laughs> scene at the moment. Um, Franklin wrote this that was read by uh, James Wilson also from, from uh, uh, Pennsylvania. He said, there are several parts of this Constitution which I do not at present approve. I am not sure that I shall ever approve of them. But in my long life, I have been forced by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions, which I once thought right, but found to be otherwise. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. And he goes on, I agree to this Constitution with all of its faults, if there are such, because I think a general government is necessary for us. It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find that this system, so this system, approaching so near to perfection as it does, and I think it will astonish our enemies. Thus I consent, sir, to this Constitution because I expect no better and because I am not sure that it is not the best. The opinions I have had of its errors I sacrifice to the public good. And he finished with this. I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of this convention who may still have an objection to it, would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this instrument. It is words I think that, uh, these are words I think we can all take with us 
and I thank you all very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it, and please come back and see us again next year. Join us out in the foyer, please. <laughs>